You're welcome. <laughs> Lovely to see you all. And uh, uh, so I, I suppose we begin with uh, guided meditation. Is that right? Yeah. And since the, the theme is uh, metta, shall we do a, a guided metta meditation? Yeah. I'm sure all of you are experts on this because it's a quite a popular meditation. Nevertheless, uh, we can still uh, do it and the way you do it. So, um, so as usual, um, I would like to look at it as a way of relaxation because what's a kind thing that we can do to ourselves, you know? For most of us, our bodies are, you know, not, not in its perfect condition. Sometimes it can be a bit painful, achy, tired, both, both bodies and minds. So it's important to start giving some attention, a bit of care and a bit of rest and relaxation towards oneself. So I invite you to sit in a way that is really comfortable for you. And uh, with that attitude of being kind to yourself, being gentle with yourself, not just your mind, but also with your body, both body and mind, that attitude of gentleness, bring that up. And also very important to bring up a beautiful smile because as we smile, the mind relaxes and also the body relaxes. And it's a very essential feature, as you would all know, as Ajahn Brahm students as well, that a smile is the most important posture, meditation posture. <laughs> So as we are relaxing into the present, if there are any parts of your body that are in pain or in difficulty, give a little bit of caring, kind attention, as if it is somebody else, your best friend, somebody who you really appreciate and somebody who you want them to be at ease and happy. So with that kind of attitude, just allow that difficult, painful feeling to be and just have that attitude of giving it care, giving it some love. So for anyone whose body is at ease and whose body is comfortable, you can still bring up this idea of 
gratitude and kindness for your body for all of these years since birth how much it has supported you with all the things that you needed to do in life carrying you into places making you able to do things without this body we wouldn't have achieved a lot of these things so instead of getting upset at any difficulties or sicknesses that we may have in our body we embrace our body with a lot of love and kindness for all the amazing care and goodness that it has given to us so just continue to have awareness of your body and continue to give it your pure love kindness and affection just like how you would for your best friend Just remember that each one of us, we have not been perfect human beings in this life. If we were, we would be fully enlightened. We still have defilements, which is why we are here. And the nature of defilements is for us to do some silly things from time to time. It is conditioned by our past. All of these our good behaviors as well as our not so good behaviors are causally the reason conditioned. And when we see this, it is possible for us to accept ourselves for who we are this incomplete 
imperfect being is good enough, is quite all right. It's only trying their very best to be good. So with that kind of attitude, you can really embrace yourself and accept yourself and give yourself a lot of kindness, a lot of affection, a lot of love. Allow these beautiful feelings of warmth and love to spread all over your body, healing every single cell, every little bone, every little space, allowing healing to happen, both in your body and your mind. And allow that brightness to build up, that warmth to build up. And stay inside of that warmth like a cocoon around you, keeping you warm, keeping you safe, with feelings of love, affection, and gentleness towards oneself.
So if the feelings of affection and love is growing strong inside of you, you can also spread it out into the entire world for all the living beings. May they all be happy. Just like us, all beings are also conditioned by their past, whether they are our friends, whether they are our enemies, or whether they are people or beings who we do not know. All of us are conditioned by our past and our actions result from that conditioning. So even these difficult people that we have in our lives, their actions are also conditioned by their past. They can't help themselves. That's why they do these things that are difficult. So when we understand these truths with the right view, we are able to allow them to be. And instead of focusing on their not so good qualities, we can look at any goodness that they have. And when we see some goodness, everybody has some goodness. We are able to really send our love and affection to everybody. So I invite you to send out and spread that beautiful feelings of warmth and affection to all beings in all realms of existence. May they all be well. May they all be happy.
Yes, we are coming close to the very last few minutes of this meditation. I invite you to just pay attention to see how you feel right now. How is it different from when you started? Were you able to relax your body? Did your mind become easeful? Were you able to bring up some love and affection to yourself? Were you able to send out love and affection to others? If yes, ask yourself why. If no, also ask yourself why. There's something to be learned from every sit. So this is how we can grow our meditation. We're learning from what worked and what didn't. I also like to ask the question, do you feel more alert and more mindful now than before? With the reflection of right view about conditionality, did your heart get inspired to bring up love to yourself and others. With that inspiration, did you get motivation or did energy arise in your mind to spread metta? Did joy come up in your mind? Did your body become tranquil? Did you become still? Not all of that may have happened to each one of us, but it's just to check. How far or how deep did we go? Any level is okay. It's degrees of happiness, degrees of peace. And everything is helpful.
You can take three deep breaths if you wish. And at the end of the last breath, you can open your eyes. Okay, so uh, maybe let's start the Dhamma talk about the true purpose of metta. So I wish this was a very engaging uh, <laughs> uh, discussion, but I suppose it's a little hard uh, in our situation. So therefore, I will just uh, discuss it by myself maybe <laughs> because people do meditation this uh, metta meditation or the meditation on loving kindness is quite a popular one and uh, many many people do this not just buddhist even people from every religion does spread love and kindness to people and beings and everybody does this for various different reasons and purposes and I'm sure all of them are quite noble and beautiful. But it is also nice to reflect and find out what was the Buddha's idea when he also encouraged us to do metta meditation. Is there a difference between how the Buddha taught or what his intentions were from the metta meditations that has been done even from the time before the time of the Buddha. Because this was a pre-Buddhist practice. Even the Brahmins used to do the four divine abode, abode meditations, the, the Brahma Viharas. So it's quite an ancient practice. So in fact, there is a very beautiful sutta for the people who like to read the suttas. In Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses, it's a, a sut, it's in the Bojanga Sangyutta, that is a chapter 46, sutta number 54, called Metta Sahagatena Sutta, accompanied by loving kindness. And in this sutta, uh, some of the monks were going out for arms. And they realized they were going out a little bit too early. People are not yet ready to offer the arms. So then they decide to go by to a nearby uh, temple, but which is not a Buddhist one. It's another religion, another sect. So there were so many different uh, spiritual people around at the time of the Buddha. So they went and had a little discussion. This seems to be the case. This comes up in many, many discourses. So they were engaged in discussion, comparing what practices, spiritual practices they were doing, how similar or how different they were. So these other uh, uh, monastics uh, who are not the Buddhists were asking the Buddhist monks, so, friends, you know, we also do this well, Brahma Viharas, the metta meditation, the meditation on compassion, on sympathetic joy and equanimity. And you also do this practice. So what is the difference here? Are we all the same or is there a difference between the way that we practice? So when they asked this question, the Buddhist monks were not quite sure how to answer this. Because they were also thinking, hmm, yeah, well, metta meditation must be just metta meditation. So maybe we are all the same. There is no difference. So, of course, they didn't say that. So, but they didn't know the answer. So they remained silent. And later, after they have taken their arms and after they've had their meal, later on in the evening, they went to see the Buddha. And they explained what happened. They related to the related the story that happened the incident that happened in the morning. And asked the Buddha, is there a difference 
in the way that we practice metta meditation and the way everybody else practice metta meditation how can we answer this question if somebody asks this question from us so to that the buddha gave this answer he said if ever somebody asks this question from you you can ask them four things i'm going to say the four things in pali that is how i will remember it and then say the english translation he said ask them kim gatika king parama king pala king pariyosana and that is kim gatika means what is the way to develop metta meditation how do you develop it what is the path and kim parama means what does it have as the leader king pala what kind of fruit does it bring and what at kim pariyosana means what is its end result when you ask these four questions most other people will not really be able to give an answer exactly in the same way that it is intended in but in the buddha's path in the dhamma so then he explains so kim gatika what is the path how do you develop metta meditation what is the path and he says the way that the metta meditation is to be developed in the buddha's dispensation is the way of developing the seven enlightenment factors the bodhijangas so as your med- metta meditation is developing the seven factors of enlightenment also needs to be coming up in your mind so this is the reason why i asked at the end of our guided meditation here as well whether did you notice your mindfulness coming up were you becoming a bit more alert were your mindfulness getting established so that is the first enlightenment factor right sati sambodhanga mindfulness then i asked the question about you know the investigation of the dhamma dhamma vichaya sambodhanga that is where we applied our mind into understanding the conditionality of human beings conditionality of our defilements they are there for a reason our behaviors our ways of uh, by body speech and mind how we act is conditioned into us and this is right view so as we reflect on this right view it is able it is possible for us to accept ourselves and accept others right so when that is happening i hope some inspiration comes up in our mind so the mavicha that investigation of the mind is the second Uh, enlightenment factor bojanga dhamma vichya sambojanga and when inspiration comes up in our mind that brings energy inevitably right whenever we are inspired to do something when we see the purpose when you go aha i understand it it makes sense i want to do it this is great this is good when you think like that when that happens energy comes up so you can see the starting roots of virya sambodhanga the energy the third factor of the uh, enlightenment factor so once you have the energy coming it's like a snowball effect after that you know joy comes up if you are able to stay with that energy with that inspiration spreading that love spreading metta to oneself and others joy is unavoidable sometimes you need a little bit more time sometimes uh, this might happen during a retreat when the conditions are more conducive but joy will come up and that is piti sambodhanga rapture yeah rapture or joy that's the fourth factor and once the rapture comes up in our mind the body becomes tranquil so that is kaya pasadhi right and after that uh the uh, body enters into the mind enters into samadhi and from that the seventh factor is upekka equanimity so it is just leading that direction the whole purpose of doing metta meditation is not just to 
make somebody well, make somebody happy, heal the world, heal ourselves, or all of those things, all of them are good and noble uh, attitudes and ideas and purposes. But the ultimate true goal of the Buddha's uh, way of medita uh, metta meditation is a way to enlightenment because what does the enlightenment factors lead to full enlightenment so so that is why the kim gatika the way the path is a way of building up or developing these uh, bojangas as we practice metta meditation we don't have to intentionally do it one by one as we are developing and cultivating metta in our hearts these factors will develop by itself in our mind right so it is quite important but right view is important so there may be a difference if there is no right view which may be the case with people with uh, another religion so there may be some differences in how the metta is being developed so there may be a difference there so in the Buddha's dispensation, a right view is a, a critical factor, an essential part in how we uh, build up this uh, metta in our hearts with right view as a basis. And uh, the next one was King Parama. What does it have as the leader? So it has as the leader these feelings of beautiful metta. And what exactly is this feeling of metta? And how is it different to the feeling of karuna? Because these sometimes get a bit mixed up because they go so closely, right? Even during metta meditation, we sometimes say, may all beings be free from suffering. But in reality, may all beings be free from suffering is the compassion meditation, karuna meditation. Because that is when we see the suffering in the world and when we have these feelings of wanting to elevate the suffering in people, that kind of feeling, that kind of wish, that is compassion. What then is this idea of metta? And I have contemplated this for a long time. And for me, uh, the one that is closest to my heart, the idea of metta, is that beautiful feeling of friendship that we have like how we feel for our best friend somebody who we see really good qualities right when we see some good qualities in people we really like them to be our friend we want them to be happy we want them to be successful right we want them to be good so we have this kind of affection we have love we have gentle feelings towards a person in whom we see good qualities. So you know the feeling that comes up within our hearts when we see good qualities in others. This is the feeling of friendship, care and gentleness. So that is the kind of feeling that I can see as metta. So it's kind of beautiful and it's kind of warm and slightly different to the feeling of compassion, karuna. So, so that is the leading factor. So the feeling of metta. That, uh, and that's what leads you uh, on the way. And then uh, King Pala, what is the fruit of this metta meditation? One of the fruits of metta meditation when it has been taken to its highest level is that you develop a psychic ability. Very interesting. So this is said to be the only psychic ability that all enlightened beings have. Because as you may know from your studies of the suttas, not all the arahants have psychic abilities. Only the ones who have all the eight jhanas, who have mastered the eight jhanas have psychic abilities. Others do not have psychic abilities, but they are fully liberated. There's no difference in their enlightenment. But psychic abilities is just a side dish. It's an interesting one for people, but it's a side dish. It, it is not necessary. But the one psychic ability that every 
every enlightened being have is this one. And it is also a result of metta. It also goes to show that metta is a state of mind of all enlightened beings as well. So, and, and what is that? That is particular, a particular sanya. And that is, you have the ability, uh, you, are, you master your perceptions. So particular means a, a repulsive object. A particular means non-repulsive. So you are able to change, master your perceptions, and you can perceive that which is repulsive as beautiful. Or you can perceive that which is beautiful as repulsive. Or you can perceive that which is repulsive at, as both repulsive and beautiful. Or you can perceive that which is beautiful as beautiful or repulsive. So you have total control over your perceptions. Kind of really beautiful. And you can also see how this is possible because throughout the time that we are developing metta, this is what we are doing, right? We're spreading it to all the beings, all the beings that are difficult and all the situations that are difficult also. So what we are trying to do is understanding that conditionality of all of these things, the causal arising of all of these things. And when we see that, when that right view gets deeply established within us, the way we perceive things can change because the way we perceive things are conditioned, are habits that we have developed over countless lifetimes. And as right view gets established within us, then it changes our ability to see things differently. So that is when we can embrace even the psychopath or a mass murderer or a pedophile and still spread our loving kindness to even these difficult people, people who most of the world might hate Right, Because we see even those beings who are doing much harm, much difficulty to themselves and others, they too are conditioned by the past. Sometimes the perpetrators of this life were the victims in the past. It goes on and on like that. This is part of right view, understanding Kamma and Vipaka, right? Actions and consequences. So applying right view. And when the right view gets established, we are able to change our perceptions. So that is a fruit. That is an ability that develops, just not like what we discussed now. This is a, a, a fruit that you get at the time of enlightenment. This is a psychic ability you get with enlightenment. And of course, the last one, the pariyosana, what is the end result of metta meditation in the Buddha's dispensation is full enlightenment. And that is the eradication of all the defilements and being free from all suffering. So it's kind of really, really beautiful. So I don't think this same idea is there in everybody who does the medita metta meditation, but as people on the Buddhist path, it is important to make that distinction and have some clarity in our mind to understand the main purpose why we do metta meditation is to really purify our own hearts, our own minds, purify our own defilements. So this is the true purpose. And it is a mind that is free from defilements, a mind that is really pure, that which can really spread true metta. And this is actually true. So the Brahma Vihara meditations, all these divine about meditations, are properly done only after jhana. But they can lead you to jhana at the beginning, but its full capacity, full potential only comes out when the mind is free of the hindrances. And you can see that how a very pure mind can said, spread out beautiful and strong feelings of love and kindness, right? So this is, 
the goal. This is where we are heading when we are developing metta meditation. It's kind of really beautiful to have this in the back of our mind. So then we can also see at the end of each metta meditation sit that some of our bojangas, these uh, enlightenment factors have come up, like we have become alert because that's what happens when we have these beautiful, pure feelings of love and affection and gentleness towards ourselves and other beings. Our mind brightens up, right? The hindrances temporarily subside because a mind that which has these feelings of metta, sensual desires does not really exist because sensual desires usually come up in a mind when it is suffering. We look into sensual desires when our mind or the body is suffering. But when our mind is happy, it's a happy state when we have these beautiful feelings of affection, love, pure feelings of metta, sensual desires do not touch our mind. Of course, uh, anger and ill will is definitely not there because as everybody knows, metta is the antidote for anger and ill will because it's the exact opposite feeling of that. So anger and ill will, which is the second hindrance, is also not there. And certainly when the mind has is full of metta, of these beautiful feelings of love, it is certainly not having sloth and torpor. Laziness and drowsiness is far away in a mind that has this energy, right? And also it is not restless and worrying about things because the mind is quite happy and contented and joyful with feelings of metta. So restlessness and worry, which is the fourth hindrance, is also not there. And of course, doubt will not be there because you can see the path factors coming together. You can see the teachings working. So you gain confidence in the teachings of the Buddha. I'm just giving you this to just see how when the mind is developing these beautiful, true feelings of metta, the hindrances are going down quite quickly. So in fact, if you are looking for a shortcut to get enlightened, <laughs> there are no real shortcuts, but metta meditation is a good one. If you're able to really develop metta meditation with its right foundations, then it is a really powerful way of really, uh, first of all, suppressing the five hindrances in the right way. So not suppressing with willpower, but with wisdom power, with understanding. And as the metta is getting strong, then it leads into deep meditation. And with deep meditation, when you have five hindrances, that's quite stable in being away, like your mind is away from the five hindrances for a long time, that pure mind can really spread out metta in a very powerful way. So that is the time, really, if it has any effect on anybody, that really is the time that it would have some effect. All other times, it's we are trying, but we don't know whether it will have an effect or not. But a mind powerful like that probably can do a little bit of change or help to others. So it's kind of nice to see these kinds of uh, things about metta. So there's a lot that can be spoken about metta meditation, uh, but I'm sure this is also a subject that many people talk about. So you're probably very familiar about a lot of these things. So um, what else can I say? So I can also uh, recite, a read out a verse relating to metta meditation. And this is again from the Sangyutta Nikaya, uh, chapter 10, uh, fourth sutta called Manibadda Sutta. And Manibadda is a name of a yaka. And he recites a verse. He asks a question or he actually says this verse and then the Buddha gives a response. So he says, it is always good for the mindful one. The mindful one thrives in happiness. It is better each day for the mindful one. And he is freed from enmity. And then the Buddha says, It is always good for the mindful one. The mindful one thrives in happiness. It is better each day for the mindful one. 
but he is not freed from enmity. One whose mind all day and night takes delight in harmlessness, who has loving kindness for all beings, for him there is enmity with none. So this is again a beautiful verse to remind us just mindfulness is isn't enough because this is also quite common in the world. It's mindfulness is a big thing, right? It's fashionable and it seems to be the important thing. But here, and there was also this understanding apparently in the time of the Buddha too. But the Buddha points out just mindfulness isn't going to get you enlightenment because mindfulness is itself isn't able to get rid of enmity right so it is that heart of metta it is that cultivation of that beautiful feelings of love through right view through right understanding through the right foundations that is when we are able to sort of uh, eradicate that second hindrance or the defilement of dosa uh, as the three three root courses so it's kind of beautiful to reflect that as well. So um, now I would like to open the floor for any questions and we can maybe have a discussion on any other any of the things that I have said here or any other things that you would like to ask in relation to metta meditation. I'll start, Venerable. Uh, it was a, I, I do a metta meditation every morning before my normal meditation. Today is a bit of a difference because it's um, gratitude for my body and the mind. And uh, so that was a big difference. And I kind of felt that was going stronger than the normal, you know, thing that I was doing every day. So thank you very much for that. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Richard, would you like to ask a question? You can unmute and ask. Um, yes, hi, Venerable. Hello. Yes, hello, nice to meet you. Um, myself, because I'm also interested in, um, sort of for many years I was practicing um, Tibetan Buddhism and, and as well. And there's a practice of exchanging yourself for others. So, you know, every single day when you wake up in the morning, I mean, you have a practice of, um, you know, everything, every single thing that you do. I mean, you know, I mean, you change it from yourself to, you know, I mean, change it. Um, sorry about this, I'm just a bit nervous on these things. So, excuse me. So, basically, what I'm trying to say is that every single thing you do, you know, I mean, you try to exchange it for, for other people, you know, for everybody else in, instead. So, I find it's actually very, it's very good for meta practice because if you actually do everything for for everybody else instead of yourself, it's actually a very good way to develop meta. So I've actually found that very helpful in myself, my own practice. So literally, um, you know, with the intention of getting up in the morning, you know, I intentionally try to have the intention as I'm. Um, you know, consciously that I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to intentionally try to help literally everything I do, you know, to be a benefit to other people with all, literally all beings, you know. I find that very, very helpful because it also helps me to actually counter my own selfishness, you know, my, you know, the hindrances in myself. It's a very good um, counterbalance. 
So it's a very good way also to develop meta. So I'm just wondering because it's actually, it has a very good, you know, I mean, the um, reaction emotionally I get to that is actually, it's a very nice feeling. It's a very wonderful feeling of, um, you know, actually contentment. It actually feels very wonderful to do these things. And it also develops wisdom at the same time because the more, I'm not saying I do it all the time, obviously, you know, I'm no saint, you know, first one to admit that. But, um, you know, I mean, the more that I try to do this, you know, I mean, the more that it seems to um, do, sort of develop that way, then the more happy I get. Whereas the more I do it for myself, then it's not really the same. So it seems to be very, very similar to meta, you know, as well. It's, it's just a different way of looking at it. So I just thought I'd share that as well. It's yeah, a different way of looking that. at meta. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing. That's quite really beautiful. So yeah. uh, each one of us have to find what triggers that feeling. So, and, and we all probably have so many different beautiful ways of cultivating it. So the starting point can be from anywhere. Yes, but sure. as we grow, it's important that we have metta for ourselves and for others. Whether you start it with from yourself or whether you start with others, it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter. Uh, you can oh, mix sure. and match. Yeah. Yeah, because I find that sounds easier for me. Yes, it's actually yeah. because of my own history. It's easier to be to help other people. And now because of that, I've actually now been able to actually be nice to myself more as well. Yeah. So, but That's I had to, had to do it that way at first, you know. So, yeah. That's right. This is common for most people. Many people find it quite hard to give metta to oneself, but quite <laughs> easy to give metta to everybody else. So yes. this is the whole reason why I started giving metta to oneself, because oneself is often forgotten but oneself mm. is not to be taken as me as being special or i oh sure i'm also just one of the others so mm. once you start to have that attitude i'm also just conditioned just like others that difference between me and others sort of uh come you know disappear and we all become just like one just conditioned beings just processes just like robots. So, you know, I'm no different. We are all kind of conditioned. We are various, but the process of who we are. So then when that right view comes closer and closer, you are able to start whichever way. But at the beginning, it doesn't really matter which way you do it. And But to make sure that before you end it, you include all. So that's good to know. Okay. Thank you Thank for you. sharing. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. And Laila? Yeah. Um, thank you, Venerable. My name is uh, I'm Leah. Uh, Leah, sorry. Yeah. No, don't worry. It's okay. It's uh, Most people get my name wrong. There's too many L's and I's and A's. <laughs> um, I, you reminded me of something important uh, that I often forget. And um, because I, Recently, I find myself, and this is because I had visitors in in September, and um, you know, obviously, when you have people, a family that you don't see all the time around, and you know, you give up your, you, it's sort of like you, you notice the the bad things. I I, I found myself um, sort of focusing on um, on the negative sides of this of these people, you know, because. Um, I think that well, you know, we get irritated and so on. And then I remembered um, we were just discussing one evening, and I just said, "Well, we should say something that we like about each other," you know. <laughs> and you just reminded me that often I catch myself thinking bad things of people, you know, like thinking of their bad sides rather than the good sides. And I think it's important that um, to see the. The, the good things in people, even if they're just one good thing, you know? And um, 
and, and obviously about ourselves as well. So because I find it quite hard to 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 do meta towards myself. I have found it hard over the last year. And so it's a good it's a good point to start with oneself, you know. Also, my other question uh, is about the current situation in Israel and Gaza. And um, I'm finding myself very affected by it because a lot of my clients are Jewish, actually. I work a lot with um, Jewish American clients and um, they're obviously very upset and very saddened by this. So I feel um, I feel quite affected by it. And I wonder, you know, what one can do is a meta meditation going to help them? It's such a desperate situation, really, because these two people can't see the good thing in to one another. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, just uh, starting with the the things that you mentioned in the beginning. So I'm guessing most of you have heard Ajahn Brahm's Two Bad Brick Story. Have you heard that one? Yes, yes, yeah. Yes. So this is this is the point, right? So it is really interesting why we tend have this tendency, including even Ajahn, the young Ajahn Brahm has yeah. the tendency to focus on just the two bad bricks when there's this 998 good ones. And this is the this is true for most beings, most human beings. We have a lot of good in us. But somehow we tend to just focus on the one or two or three bad things about ourselves and others. One of the things that I realized and noticed is that it is our sense of self. So even though when it comes to our bad things, we beat ourselves down, <laughs> which is what we do and are unable to give metta to ourselves, but when it comes to others, the reason why we focus on others' goodness is because we feel we are not good enough. When we see other people's bad, when we focus on that, somehow deep inside, we feel, oh, I'm better than them. Well, they are bad, but I'm good. That kind of very subtle feeling is there. And that is that sense of self trying to put somebody down and seeing that I'm better than them, even though that is not consciously there, that is that sense of self trying to do that that is why we try to focus so there mm -hmm. is at the end of the day there is no good that is achieved by focusing on any negative qualities just that is why it is so important to understand and apply that right view right view about this all these defilements all these views all these concepts conventions that we have taken up are conditioned to us by our past, not just this life, but even past lives. And they, then we just act them out. And as we do this, some of these are going to be unskillful. And this is true for myself and for others. So mm -hmm. once we see that, then we are able to sort of accept that reality. It doesn't mean that you allow yourself to continue and give yourself excuses to continue the way, but you stop hating yourself or hating others or putting them down for what they do. Instead, you realize, well, there's no point in looking and focusing on these one or two or three bad things of the person, but let me look at the good things. And there's so many good things about people. And also, again, as students of Ajahn Brahmali, he never fails to tell this uh, sutta on uh, five ways of removing resentment. Right? There are five ways to remove resentment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I may not go into the sutta here, but you can check it out or check listen to any one of Ajahn Brahmali's retreats. Every retreat he talks about this sutta. And, mm -hmm. and that is about, precisely about that. This is a teaching of the Buddha saying that any in, in any person, if you see somebody doing bodily actions that are uh, imperfect or incorrect or not good, don't focus on that. That's not going to be helpful for you. In that sutta, it's like you are thirsty, it's a hot day, and you are in search of some water. So, for example... And then if you just focus on the person's bad qualities, you are only going to burn down and get even more hot. Mm -hmm. 
But if you look at the person's good qualities, it is like you come across a pond with algae, right? Mm -hmm. So you just push the algae with your hands and with your cupped hands, you can take some cool water and drink. And that cool water is the person's good qualities. This mm. is just one example of the five. So like that, sometimes it is hard to see. It is also because we, our sense of self doesn't want to say, see the good goodness in others. But it is a thing that we have to sort of condition ourselves if it is hard to see because there is no benefit in focusing otherwise. And then it is slowly, slowly able to recondition because we are conditionally focusing like that. The, we are culturally conditioned. If you look at news, that uh. is how news about fault finding if people get together how we talk about a third person is like that so we are heavily conditioned to look fault find fault in things imperfections complain about things so actually we have to feel sorry for ourselves being trapped sometimes it's so hard to get out and go against this strong current of conditioning so mm. this is why in the Buddhist path, recognizing that and slowly turning around and slowly turning around to focus on the good is really, really important. Now, before we I go into nation's problems, I want to talk about family. Mm -hmm. Now, in families, this is also happening. People, husbands and wives who used to love each other for a, in the beginning, their love has fallen apart over the years. This is quite a common thing. Sometimes parents and children, their love for each other also falls apart. And this is again very common in the world. And, what, and these were people who had a lot of love and affection for each other to begin with. What happened? You know, this is what happened. What happens is as time goes by, as you get to know each other well, as you go through life's experiences, you get to see people's full qualities, like overall at the beginning, especially when you fall in love with somebody, we are all in our best behavior, right? So only our good, nice qualities are mostly visible. But as we go through life, as challenging situations come about, then our other sides also come up, like our anger comes, in, uh, comes out, our irritations, impatience, all kinds of negative qualities come out. We can't help it. We are conditioned beings. So, But when we see these qualities in our loved ones, then suddenly we are a little bit shocked. And then we start to focus on that one or two bad qualities in this loved one. And when we see bad qualities in an, another person, our love actually goes down. But the sad thing is when our love and affection goes down, together with that, your respect goes down, your trust also goes down. When these things go, go down, the relationship falls apart. So this is what happens to many relationships in the world, whether it is husbands and wives, parents and children, brothers and sisters, work colleagues at work, all of these things. So it's really important to also remember our, our happiness or our suffering is a lot to do with our relationships in, the, in our life. Our interactions with people causes the most difficulty. So it is really important that we manage our relationships in a good way. And in order to do that, having affection, having respect and having trust between our people is very important. But it is easy for me to say hard to do just precisely because of our tendency to look at the negative qualities of people. So if we want our relationships to work well, then we have to make effort to condition ourselves to really, really see the good qualities in these people because they have plenty, 998 good qualities and we have to really condition ourselves to see them and make much of them. And as we see the good qualities in these people, when we see good qualities, what comes up in our heart is affection, love, and care. And with that comes up respect, with that comes up trust as well, that ability to. So it is really important thing to be able to slowly recondition our habit of instead of fault finding, to find the goodness. So this is 
the in what I have to say in relation to the first thing that you mentioned. And the second thing, yes, about the countries and how can we help? Like I said, the meta meditation, uh, to be able to have an influence on somebody else's mind, we have to first of all have a very pure and powerful mind. So mm -hmm. only a mind that has that kind of real power, a mind come out of jhana, will have an ability to maybe have an influence on others for well-being. But placebo effect can still work. So you can tell the people uh, that you are sending them good wishes, care and love, and that kind of feeling of knowing that somebody cares for you, somebody loves you, somebody sending you good wishes, mm -hmm. that is helpful. So, you know, that kind of thing is helpful and it is nice thing to do for us anyway while we are, if we are not there yet with our jhana practice and that's okay still to do. But the metta meditation is really, really to do of the purification of our own heart, not so much to do with purification of others and helping others. That is uh, not always going to work unless you are a pure being. So, so therefore, that's what. But the thing is, if you are able to uh, share with them some right view, the conditionality of things, how why people do unskillful things, how they are conditioned, but also why how they are the owners of their own actions, their intentional actions, the karma. So when you see that, you know, people who are doing harm and difficulty to others, they will have to reap consequences in the future. Then there is a possibility that a bit of compassion might come up in their hearts. So you can only try. And again, everybody is at different places in their spiritual growth. So for some people, when you speak, share right view it'll make sense for some people they're not there yet to be able to understand or relate to it and there is a not not a lot that we can do <laughs> in that situation but you can still try and explain and see what happens yeah thank you that's, thank that's you very much. okay thank you for that a wonderful reminder of um elaborating on finding the good in other people that was that was that was a great reminder thank you thank you okay So uh, there is just a little few minutes. Let me just read out as a wrap up, just the benefits of metta meditation. I'm sure most of you would know this. This is just to wrap up, to have joy and get inspiration to do, continue to do metta meditation. And this is the benefits of metta meditation coming up in numerical discourses, chapter 11, sutta number 15. There the Buddha says, because when the liberation of mind by loving kindness has been pursued, developed and cultivated, made a vehicle and basis, carried out, consolidated and properly undertaken, 11 benefits are to be expected. What 11? One sleeps well. One awakens happily. One does not have bad dreams. One is pleasing to human beings. One is pleasing to spirits. Deities protect one. Fire, poison and weapons do not injure one. One's mind quickly becomes concentrated. One's facial complexion is serene. One dies and confused, and if one does not penetrate further, one fares on to the Brahma world. So what it means is one fares on further means full enlightenment. So uh, here what I wanted to mention is about one factor, because here it is also said that we have protection from fire, right? It says Metta meditation has protection from fire. 
But Buddha never contradicts himself. But we also know from the Buddha's teachings, there is one sutta where there was a queen, Sama. Uh, I can't remember who the king was, but uh, the, the king had many, uh, of course, uh, uh, queens. Uh, Sama was queen number one. And queen number two was Magandhya. And Magandhya, the second queen, was quite jealous of the first queen. And because of her jealousy, she wanted to kill uh, Queen Sama. So, so she was successful, this is in very short, uh, to burn down Queen Sama and 500 of her friends in one go. They were, made it, they were inside one palace and she, the, the second queen, Magandhya, uh, managed to sort of put fire into that whole building and all 500 of them uh, died. But Queen Sama was a very practicing Buddhist and she was said to have mastered like, you know, the, the fraud for divine abodes. So she was telling all the women together there to practice this metta meditation towards the person who was uh, causing this fire. But anyway, the, uh, the point I want to make is their metta meditation did not protect them from burning down and dying, right? Yet the Buddha says metta meditation provides protection from fire. So this is just to remember metta meditation is not really pro giving protection from the fire as in the bushfires or this kind of actual physical fire. But what metta meditation gives you protection against is the fires of the mind. There are 11 fires that the Buddha talks about and they are in the Aditya Pariyaya Sutta, the fire sermon. Uh, uh, it's, I think, in the Sangyutta Nikaya. I can't remember the sutta reference, but it's quite a famous sutta that is chanted and available. And in there, it is uh, the, the, the main fires are the fire of lust, fire of hatred, fire of delusion, and there is the fire of birth, old age, sickness, death, sorrow, lamentation, despair, all of those things. So they are considered as fires. So these are the fires of the mind. But when you cultivate metta meditation, you cool down. You cool down so much that those fires cannot burn you anymore. So it's really, really beautiful. So that is the benefit of metta meditation. So I just wanted to bring that up because the, there is this wrong understanding that by doing metta meditation, one might be protected from this kind of physical fires and you might have a big heart of metta and run into a house that is on fire to try to save somebody. But please be warned that you will not have that kind of protection. And also what it is mentioned as weapons and poisons, because Buddha also calls these things, all of these 11 things as weapons and poisons as well as fire. So it is those mental fires, mental weapons, and mental poisons that we have a protection from metta, but not from the actual physical weapons, poisons, and fire. So don't try to drink metta poison thinking that you have lots of metta and nothing would happen to you or don't go in front of a man with weapons who's about to shoot people. Uh, you will not have really, it, there are stories about monks and nuns and stuff like that. They, they may be true, they may not be true. We are not sure about it, but definitely uh, the protection that you get against is this mental fires. So I just wanted to mention that too, since we had a little bit of time. But I suppose we've come to the last five minutes and it is the time for the last present, uh, announcement, I suppose, yeah. Thank you for listening. And thank you very much for your teaching and guidance and for being here with us and for your support all the way through the Rains Retreat of our community. Thank you very much. Okay. Venerable Chanda will be back with us in seven to 10 days. So um, it's come around fast again. And with that in mind, we would like to invite everybody to revisit the Anukampa website, which is found at www.anukampaproject.org. And on this website, 
we would especially like to mention a few pages. The first one being the events page, um, where you can find the upcoming tour dates for Ajahn Brahm's tour of the UK. And also, when Venerable Chandra is back, then the online sessions will begin again, including the Sutta discussion club, um, discussions and also the meta chanting on Saturday mornings. So if you'd like to join those things, those meetings with us, please have a look on the website on the events page at the top of the website, and you'll be able to find the links to these different events. Another page that we'd like to invite you to look at is the, the page that is called Visit. And on the visit page, it gives a list of different ways that you'll be able to support the community, especially Venerable Chanda, while she is living in Oxford. And this includes ways of being able to offer food and time and also being able to support monetary if you feel that is what you'd like to do. Another way to do this is to look at the donation page on the website, which is uh, www.anukampraproject.org forward slash donate and I would just like to say I hope you have a good week and see you again next week for a peer-led session with Shirley so hope to see you then <laughs>